Right, now, first, the toughie. Is assisted dying right or wrong? Please do get your calls coming in. This is something that could affect all of us at one point. That number is 0207 862 2222. Earlier this morning, Jeremy spoke to Sir Keir Starmer about his stance on assisted dying. He wants to see a free vote. Let's have a look at what he said. You support making, stopping it being illegal to assist someone dying. You personally support that? Yes, subject to very strong safeguards. Okay, all right. But, but, you but, but what Esther Ransom wants is, is for Parliament to vote on it. But it's not a Labour right. policy, that. It's something you'll just... You'll it, let it, the vote in, happen. In the end, it's uh, this'll be a, a free vote. Free vote, Because okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a real matter of conscience. And I, I absolutely recognise there are strong views the other way. My personal... Um, position is that at the moment it's a complete crime to do assist in any shape form or way um, and the prosecutor decides in the end whether you're going to be prosecuted very very good interview with uh, sir Keir this morning but do you agree with what he said on assisted dying or do we need to be a little bit more cautious i'm going to come to you first crystal on this one what do you make? It's a tough, it's a real toughie to talk about, especially when you have got ageing relatives or you know and love someone that is, is in severe pain. I agree. And I think it's important, firstly, to make the distinction between assisted dying and assisted suicide. Yes. Assisted dying is when, uh, essentially, you are, unfortunately, terminal already and it's then you, the way I see it, taking control of how that day comes. The, the Esther Ranson situation, who has stage four lung cancer. Absolutely. Um, and I think that, that Keir Starmer, um, in what he said, was right in as much as that the, there needs to be a vote on this. I think that with the correct safeguards, this is something that should happen. I'm not scared of dying. I'm scared of dying mm. alone mm. in a horrible situation where many people who are in the situation where they're terminal, um, and if they've had that diagnosis and those safeguards are in place, are having to go to clinics where they know no one, where they're in unfamiliar surroundings. We treat dogs better. We treat animals better that, that go through this. And if someone is terminal already, has made the informed decision and are, are, are of the cognitive ability to do so, that they want to take control of the process, surrounded by their loved ones, in their own home. It's actually got nothing to do with the state. It's got nothing to do with anyone else. It is their decision and it is the humane thing to do. As long as those safeguards are in place, I think that this is something that should happen. Jim, I was lucky enough to interview Rebecca Wilcox, uh, Dame Esther Ranson's daughter, recently on this subject, and she fully supports what her mum is campaigning for. But she said, because of the law, I won't be there to hold a hand when mum finally goes. So what, what do you make of the whole law and the setup in this country around this? Though it's such a sad and potentially uncomfortable discussion, I'm actually feeling quite liberated that we're having it. Mm, yes. I think that the issue of death is something that we could all get better mm. at finding a way or cultivating a language to mm. talk about in collective. It's really humanising for us to recognise yes. the, the levity, um, the potential of coming together and the, the humanity in how we die, as it's something that we're all going to go through and we see many of our loved ones do. So removing the stigma of talking about death, making it part of a democratic decision and having a universal conversation is very moving to me. And I would say that I am in agreement that, again, by giving people a say and a power is a, a, a quite... a an empowering part of history. And I think it could be an amazing thing, you know, futuristically. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we, we have got a, um, a doctor now, Dr Amy Prophet, um, who is a consultant in palliative care. Um, Dr Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, what, what do you make of, firstly, what uh, Sir Keir said on the programme earlier this morning and what you've heard my panellists say today? Yeah, thank you, Dawn, for having me on um, this afternoon. Um, and much like Gemma, I really welcome the conversation. I think it's time for the conversation to occur. But if we are going to vote on this, 
we need to be clear what it is we're voting for. We've made that mistake in the past with a binary in or out question or yes or no. And we need the conversation about what it really means. And I'd like to pick up on something Christo said earlier in terms of the terminology. There is no difference between assisted dying and assisted suicide. It's just the word. Actually, most people in the general public, when we've asked them, believe that assisted dying is helping someone who is in the dying process with hospice style care whilst they're dying or carefully withdrawing treatment so they die peacefully. Both of those things already exist and are completely legal. What this is, is a doctor administering lethal medication that brings about someone's death that has potential side effects. None of these medications have actually been licensed or um, used or, or properly researched anywhere in the world. And there are consequences and side effects of that. In terms of the safeguards, what's been proposed in Parliament previously, what's been proposed in Holyrood and the House of Keys in Jersey is a physician's assisted death where a doctor has to be involved in this. And therefore that puts it slap bang in the NHS, which is incredibly dangerous for an NHS that is already broken. And none of the safeguards that have ever been proposed have prevented the extension of this the slippery slopes, and it does not protect the vulnerable, the disabled in society, those with dementia, those without capacity. And it extends everywhere that it's legislated, despite any safeguards that have been put in place. I consider this to be very dangerous in the NHS itself. And I think we need the conversation to understand the implications of this for society as a whole, rather than as looking at the autonomous right for an individual to choose something. And uh, Dr. Amy, what would you say to somebody like Dame Esther Ranson, who doesn't, as, as Christo alluded to, her, you know, not scared of dying, but scared of dying in pain. I lost my own dad to lung cancer and it was horrific to watch those final weeks, the pain he was in. I would have done anything to have helped him. What would you say to those people now who, who, who want that right to not suffer those final weeks in terrible pain, provided the right checks and balances are in place? I'm very sorry to hear of your own experience, Dawn, um, and the fear that people might die in pain. Actually, that's not a reality if you have fully funded specialist palliative care, if you have mental health um, services in the country, if you have carer support um, and suicide prevention in the country as well. We're asking the wrong question here when we haven't got those things right first. My job as a palliative care consultant is to alleviate pain. And I use that in a nuanced way. There is no that bare minimum dose of morphine that, that has to be used. There are other nuanced ways to relieve pain and suffering in a holistic way that approaches that person as an individual. Very sadly, 180,000 people a year die in the UK with no access to specialist palliative care. And we're reliant on 70% charity funding for our services. Surely the government has a duty and a responsibility to act on that first before we vote on something which is incredibly dangerous. And if you look in other legislations, in Belgium, there is no age limit for this. In the Netherlands, the age limit is 12. In Canada, have been seeking to remove the age limit to 12 and have extended into a sole diagnosis of mental health disorder or those with homelessness. People ask for this because of feeling a social burden, a loss of sense of self, a loss of who they are and a fear of what might come with a sword of Damocles hanging over their head, Amy, which is certainly not going to be the case. Amy, sorry to interrupt. We've got so many callers. Please stay with us. We've got so many callers that want to talk to both you and our panel as well. Uh, we're going to go to Carol in Buckinghamshire first. Carol, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for calling. What would you like to say? Um, yeah, um, my, my sister, um, she had MS. She was diagnosed when she was about 28. And uh, about 13 years ago, we had to put her in a care home. She was completely mute. She was blind. She was fed through a tube. And she was in a stiff fetal position with her mouth gaping open most days. They couldn't do um, mouth um, cleaning because her, it would close shut so tight that it damaged her lips. 
And my sister laid there for 13 years. Oh, Carol, I'm so and, sorry. Yeah, and I, I thought it's like to have a broken soul because no one should see that. Oh, Carol, I'm so sorry. Your, your, your thoughts are so much with you. Um, Amy, what would you like to say to Carol about the situation she found herself in with her sister? Carol, that sounds really, really horrible for you all. And that experience will stay with you all, I'm sure. I'm really sorry to hear that. But my concern over what's being proposed with these safeguards around assisted dying, assisted suicide, is this six month terminal diagnosis. We can't determine that in this country. As doctors, it's an art of other certainty to determine six months. And as your sister's experience shows, actually that safeguard has been challenged in other countries as discriminatory mm -hmm. because someone with a condition like MS, which can last for many, many years, is ineligible for the law that's been passed. And therefore that terminal diagnos diagnosis was removed very quickly in Canada to extend out to others. And that's why it's now eligible for people with a mental health disorder. And at the age of 12, imagining a 12 year old girl with a mental health disorder being eligible for this if she's capacitous to do it myself, it's, it's very, very dangerous and I'm so sorry. I think in these sad circumstances where we hear people have died in pain and um, people have suffered in that way, then that care must be examined very, very carefully rather than changing the law in such a sweeping state and letting the flood barriers come down and the flood come in. In Canada, up to 3.3% of all deaths in Canada are now assisted dying. That would equate to between 22,000 and 44,000 people in the UK every year that would be eligible for assisted dying under the laws that are being proposed. And I just worried about the NHS, I'm worried about society. And I re really, my heart goes out to you and your sister for what you experienced. And I hope no one ever has to experience that again. Uh, Amy, thank you very much. And, and Carol, thank you so much for that call. Um, you know, th thoughts with your uh, horrible experience. Uh, let's move on to Yvonne in London. Uh, good afternoon, Yvonne, what would you like to say? Um, th thank you. Thank you for speaking to me. Um, I've been a nurse all my life. I'm now 72. I've retired. And I must say, I I've given um, terminally ill people some pain relief towards the end. With the, it takes time. By the time they need it, it takes time to find another nurse, check it, and give it to them. Sometimes the, you can't find another nurse. She would have gone for a break or busy. Mm -hmm. So the poor patient has to wait. This is the reality. Um, sometimes there's shorter staff. Uh, I, I have seen them. Um, when I was younger, it, it was like, like a routine work. But I didn't fully understand it till my later life. I, I've had another patient um, who would simply cry with pain, and 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 the for some reason the family resisted giving her morphine, although you could see clearly this person is still still suffering, suffering, and this she would cry day and night, and what they were they allowed us to give her was more uh, sorry coding four times a day. And clearly she needed morphine. And and this really, I can still hear her cries. I, I, it really bothers me. And unfortunately, I, I am diagnosed with osteoarthritis um, for the last six months. And I started feeling pain. And I'm thinking, I, I, I mean, this is so uncomfortable. Um, am I going to be in that position? Would somebody block? block it would, would anyone consider my my needs I, when you are later or in that position all that matters is is just you want to be pain free nothing else matters this is what i believe so it should be given to people who want it the uh, assisted living service should be given to people and there are safeguards ca that can be put in for example maybe it's not a good um, example like 
if you if somebody needs an abortion, there are two doctors who has to of course. Um, agree to that. If I'm and, my, if and it, Yvonne, my lovely, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Thank you so much for your call. Really appreciate it. And I, I hope you do. You, you don't. Um, you don't end up in too much pain. It's a, so many emotional stories. Uh, Dr. Amy Prophet, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Um, now, an incredibly difficult conversation. If you have been affected by anything we've spoken about this morning, there is help available. You can contact the Samaritans 24 hours a day, seven days a week to talk about anything that is unset, upsetting you. The number is 116123 and it's free from any phone. Mental health charity Mind uh, provides information on where you can get help also. The number there is 0300 123 double three nine three available from nine till six monday to friday and national suicide prevention helpline uk can help those struggling with their mental health well-being that number is 0800 689 5652 and their phone lines again are open from six to midnight every day of the week please don't suffer alone now thank you for all your calls on this uh later should we pay